ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰਾਮ ਇਲੈਕਸ਼ਨ ਸਪੈਸ਼ਲ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇੱਕ ਵਾਰੀ ਫਿਰ ਮੈਂ ਜਸਵੀਰ ਪੋਗਲ ਸਾਡੇ ਸਾਰੇ ਵਿਜ਼ਨ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਟੀਵੀ ਦੇ ਦਰਸ਼ਕਾਂ ਦਾ ਬਹੁਤ ਬਹੁਤ ਸਵਾਗਤ ਕਰਦਾ ਅੱਜ ਸਾਡੇ ਵਿਨੀਪੈਕ ਸਟੂਡੀਓ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਅਸੀਂ ਗੱਲਬਾਤ ਕਰਾਂਗੇ ਇੱਕ ਹੋਰ ਕੈਂਡੀਡੇਟ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਕਿ ਸਿਰਫ ਔਰ ਸਿਰਫ ਕੈਂਡੀਡੇਟ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈ ਬਲਕਿ ਗ੍ਰੀਨ ਪਾਰਟੀ ਆਫ ਮੈਨੀਟੋਬਾ ਦੇ ਲੀਡਰ ਨੇ ਨਾਮ ਹੈ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਜੇਮਸ ਬੈਰਮ ਫੋਰਟ ਰੂਸ਼ ਤੋਂ ਆਪ ਐਮਐਲਏ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਲੜ ਰਹੇ ਨੇ ਔਰ ਪਾਰਟੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਗ੍ਰੀਨ ਪਾਰਟੀ ਹੈ ਉਸ ਨੂੰ ਲੀਡ ਵੀ ਕਰ ਰਹੇ ਨੇ ਮੈਨੀਟੋਬਾ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚੋਂ ਵੈਲਕਮ ਜੇਮਸ ਟੂ ਆਰ ਸਟੂਡੀਓ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਵੈਰੀ ਮਚ ਫॉर ਹੈਵਿੰਗ ਮੀ ਵੈਰੀ ਪਲੀਜ਼ ਟੂ ਹੈਵ ਯੂ ਹੀਅਰ ਸਪੈਸ਼ਲੀ ਦਾ ਲੀਡਰ ਆਫ ਦਾ ਪਾਰਟੀ ਦੈਟ ਇਜ਼ ਰਨਿੰਗ ਇਲੈਕਸ਼ਨਸ ਇਨ ਮੈਨੀਟੋਬਾ ਐਂਡ ਦ ਇਲੈਕਸ਼ਨਸ ਆਰ ਟੂ ਬੀ ਹੈਲਡ ਔਨ 10th ਆਫ ਸੈਪਟੈਂਬਰ ਇਫ ਆਮ ਰਾਈਟ ਥੈਟ ਇਜ਼ ਕਰੈਕਟ ਐਂਡ ਦ ਬੀ ਐਡਵਾਂਸ ਵੋਟਿੰਗ ਆਈ ਥਿੰਕ ਸਟਾਰਟਿੰਗ ਦ 29th ਆਫ ਆਗਸਟ ਫੋਰ ਅ ਵੀਕ ਬਿਫੋਰ ਥੈਟ ਆਈ ਥਿੰਕ ਸੋ ਯਾ so uh the time is uh, pretty much approaching and it is. <laughs> uh, what do you say about your preparations for the election our preparations well i mean uh, i was just talking we're at about 27 candidates right now and counting we are pushing towards 57 that will be the first time we've given every manitoba the option to vote green and i feel confident that hopefully we're going to be able to achieve that obviously it's busy 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 uh, i wake up at 7 8 a.m. at night and go to bed past midnight and get up and do it all over again the next day and the next day but that's okay because i'm more than happy to put in the work because it's about making a different manitoba it's about making a more sustainable manitoba one that we focus on reducing poverty addressing climate change and improving our healthcare system why well, I, i could uh, definitely uh, understand you getting up that early because you are not just um uh, just party spending the elections your constituency and you're also um uh competing uh, Vab Kanu that's a leader of the NDP that's here. right uh, so it's going to be a, a big battle uh, between uh, leaders and uh, you also have to help other candidates of yours all over Manitoba that's quite accurate yeah it's going to be it's one of the 10 ridings to watch people have already listed it as it's a leader to leader the leader of the NDP versus the leader of the Greens i'm hoping people are going to go green of course but uh and you're right in addition to that i've got to support my other candidates i've got to do central media interviews uh i've got to also you know help make decisions with my executive council that need to be made but you know we have a good team um we are a bunch of volunteers right it's done by passion because we really care about the planet and we care about this province and you know that that's one of the things that really drives me forward that we have people that really have that heart and i think what we have is you know bold vision and real solutions and we'd encourage people to go to greenparty.mb.ca they can read more about us and so you are at 27 candidates right now mm-hmm. i understand that calling up the elections early about a year uh has definitely affected your plans uh your uh, uh, long term planning uh, when it came to the elections um so 27 candidates still have 30 more to go if you want to run on all the correct seats in Manitoba and the time is fast approaching and uh, would you be able to find all those candidates in I time? think so I think today I was talking just came back from a council meeting with my team as we made those decisions I was talking about and so we're at 27 but we have I think uh, another 10 or so in the queue there was four new candidate interest came in today alone mm-hmm. so I mean that shows that we think we can get there is it a push yeah sure I mean we sort of were working on a longer time frame it's too bad that our premier doesn't want to respect the fixed date election law um but that decision's been made and and you know you're ultimately stuck with a decision of do you respond or do nothing and obviously you have to respond so that's what we've done and uh you know i will highlight this would be the first time we've ran a full slate of candidates this would be the third actually general election i've taken the party through and i've grown our slate from uh 15 candidates in 2007 yeah. to 32 candidates the at the height in 2011 and 30 the election before so you know we're set to exceed what we've done last time i hope we're going to give every manitoba that option i feel you know uh cautiously optimistic that we're going to uh, achieve that but uh yeah i mean and so you know the people out there if there's someone that feels that they would be a good candidate and they'd serve their community we're looking to talk to people and fill in more candidates we think every manitoba deserves the option to vote green and i hear that from people and i've heard that from people since i first ran in 2007 So here's the call from uh, the leader of the Green Party here uh, for uh, any potential candidate who wants to uh, run in the election and who has the same ideology as Green Party does. And uh, talking about the uh, ideology, so Green Party is pretty unconventional party, I would say. Sure, I think that's fair. Not right, not left, but forward. That's what we like sometimes like to say. Let's talk about uh let's let's talk more about the ideology that Green Party runs with. Sure. 
I think one of the things that I keep coming back to is interconnectedness. Okay. I think the other parties, and for years, did they put they put the environment sort of over here somewhere, mm -hmm. and then and other, some other, parties have been denying it altogether. The environmental issues. Exactly denying it. We've seen even outright deniers. But yeah. even if they do admit to it. It's sort of over here in a column by itself, and yeah. the economy is over here in a separate column, and other issues are all in a separate column. Well, what we recognize is that it's all interconnected. So we don't have a strong economy unless we have a healthy biosphere and environment to live on. I mean, the economy is entirely reliant on that, as is our whole society. Beyond that, though, even on other policy areas, so one of the th things that's really important to us is reducing uh, poverty. And the way we're going to do that is through the tax system with the basic income that would make a drastic reduction in poverty, a 48% reduction in poverty rates and a 33% reduction in the depth of poverty. Um, but that's also important when you think about health care, because what's one of the leading social determinants for health? You know, poverty is itself determines how healthy people often are. So that connects into long-term health care savings, long-term savings for the justice system. So one of the things I think that's important about Greens is recognizing the interconnectedness of everything. And then I think beyond that, I think politicians have, in our own system, have often been challenged with uh, the problem of incrementalism. They want to do just a tiny little thing. They want something that gets them two or three press releases, but that doesn't actually make substantial just, change. Uh, just announcements, just hollow announcements. So, for instance, Wab Canoe and the NDP put out their recent platform. It comes up with $70 million in new expenditures and new revenues and adjustments. So they're talking about a $70 million uh, tweak on the, on the tax system on a $17 billion budget. We're talking about a $1.58 billion tax shift. I mean, I think we just need bigger moves like this. If we're going to talk climate change, you know, we need to do more than just talk and talk and talk about it. That's sadly what I saw with the previous NDP government for 17 years here in Manitoba and the PC government over the past three years has been quite blunt that they're fine with emissions just staying level and not doing anything to address climate change. Honestly, we've, you know, we've seen the alarm bells rang by the United uh, Nations International Panel on cli uh, Climate Change, um, we have 12 years to act and get things in place by 2030. So we've got to start now if we're going to do that over 12 years. So once again, that's bold vision and real solutions. That's helping Manitobans better insulate their houses. That's helping Manitobans go over to electric transportation. And you know, the good news about that is, what does that mean? Well, if we're hiring a bunch of people to insulate our houses, that means more jobs and a stronger economy in Manitoba. What does it mean if we electrify transportation? It means we're bringing less fuel, fossil fuels from outside of the province and we're relying on mm -hmm. our own energy that we can produce right here and thereby also growing our economy. So there's a lot of win-wins and it comes back to understanding the interconnectedness of everything. Of course, for the bigger deal, for the bigger deals, you have to sit on a bigger table as well. Uh, yeah. So when we talked about the uh, poverty eradication, mm -hmm. you talked about the tax cuts. So there's recently been a tax cut that was uh, a cutback of one percent on PST, yeah. which the government stated that will help um, improving the uh, lifestyle of the Manitobans. Um, but then again, it's also going to result into about 325 million of deficit. Yeah. Uh, so, what do you say about that that tax cut? Was it something uh, that was a bona fide decision of the government, or was it just uh, candy before the elections? I certainly think the government wants to use it as candy before the elections. I'm not sure that it was right, the right decision. However, for the Green Party, just discussed this tonight with my council, we're not looking to adjust the PST rates in our first term. We don't necessarily agree with it. Probably had you had a Green government all along, we might have left it at 8%, but now that's been done. What we are looking to do is introduce a pollution fee, also known as a carbon tax mm -hmm. on fossil fuels, and have that start at $50 a ton and increase $10 a ton thereafter. So it starts at 12 cents a liter and that people can expect two cents a liter thereafter on gasoline and or diesel, roughly. But that's something in line with, uh, with something the Liberal Party did. It is in line uh, with, and in fact, it's, it's actually more in line with something the Greens have been calling for since as long as I've been involved in the party in, in 2006. Um, and we've seen other leaders sort of, Stefan Dion notoriously federally picked up that policy and then it disappeared from the Liberals and it reappeared in the Trudeau area. What I will say though is they also were lacking policy coherence federally. We're seeing them declare a climate emergency on the same day as they approve a new pipeline. Mm -hmm. So what's lacking is some policy coherence, notwithstanding 
Um, I think the Liberals were correct to put a price on, on carbon pollution. Um, I wish our Premier would have stuck with his original plan. Uh, I don't think $25 a time not increasing it was enough, but it was more. Uh, than what they're planning to do now. And unfortunately, it was Bob Canoe and the NDP that chose to block that bill that created the political space for this current government to flip-flop on that promise and to sort of line themselves with Doug Ford and other um, over-the-top conservative premiers that we're seeing come in across Canada. Uh, and this sort of shows where the Greens have a consistency of approach on that. But also important on our carbon tax is, yes, we're going to use some of it to reduce taxes elsewhere. You need to do that to help blunt the impact on people. But you also need to spend some of it on those initiatives I talked about. Better insulating houses, electrifying transportation, flaring methane and creating composting programs in our province. You know, those are some of the hot top four and or five energy I might saving say. houses and I think the federal government has also introduced a program uh, for uh, easier mortgages on energy saving houses. And I think they well. just reintroduced one in the last budget but I'd note that there was a really good program mm -hmm. actually to be fair to the federal Martin government of the Liberals in 2006 for the energy home retrofit uh, that was in place that was then axed by the Harper Conservatives. So you're right and you know one thing about Greens is Certainly I've got criticism to say of the other parties, but we're also willing to work with other parties and acknowledge that, hey, maybe not everything was perfect, but the Martin government's eco-energy retrofit, even Rather the Rather than outrightly denying their efforts, right? If, if, yeah. the, if an effort is as good, why not just enhance it? Maybe it's only half rate? as good as I want, but yeah. rather than me saying that it's a terrible idea and trying to just dismiss it, I will point out it's half as good as I want. You know, here's, do here, here's a soft applause, but yeah, can we do better? Can we can we improve? Can we can we dream bigger? And I think Greens actually accomplished that. You talk about carbon taxes. You talk about a basic income. Um, you know, you talk about a number of issues where Greens have been leading and pushing these issues onto the agenda. And what we're really hoping to accomplish in this election is get a few Greens elected and change the tenure and the mm -hmm. tone in the legislature. And we've seen that in Prince Edward Island where the Greens are the official opposition, federally with Elizabeth May, and in British Columbia where they hold their, what we like to call their responsibility uh, of power, or the responsibility of balance rather than the balance of power. But nonetheless, they had you know the seats that determined how people were gonna govern in BC. And they were able to have real influence in terms of politics there, including getting corporate money out of politics, uh, including you know uh, promises to sort of uh, deal with opposing the expansion of pipelines through British Columbia. So there are a number of initiatives that they were able to push forward, and you know, in many ways, in an ideal scenario, I'd love to also have the balance of responsibility and really be able to push the other parties forward. I mean, I'd also love to be sitting in the premier's chair, but I'm willing to accept that getting the balance of responsibility would be a great first pl a great first start. Course. Okay, now is the time to take a little break. We'll talk uh, about health and education after this break. Okay, wonderful. Hon vela ji ek chote je break da wapas aune hain election special program de vich. Aaj assi gal baat kar rahe hain James Madam de naal jehde ne Green Party de leader Manitoba de vich. ब्रेक तो बाद एक बार फिर थोड़ा बहुत बहुत स्वागत प्रोग्राम इलेक्शन स्पेशल देविच आज जो सिकाल बात कर रहे हैं हम जेम्स बैडम देना जिधर ने ग्रीन पार्टी ऑफ मैनिटोबा के लीडर नाली नाल एमएलए कैंडिडेट फ्रॉम फोर्ट रूज कंस्टिट्यूएंसी सो जेम्स बिफोर द ब्रेक वी वर टॉकिंग अबाउट इनवायरमें topics that's the hottest topic that's been going around mm -hmm. um, especially with the closing of the ERs and stuff yep what is the Green Party going to do about that sure well firstly I think it's clear that the premier broke his promises that he was going to consult with frontline health care workers and in fact they've tried to roll these changes through so fast that we've seen in the news that they've actually had to turn down free help for a mobile uh, clinic with doctors without borders and other actions so the first thing is you got to actually 
sit down, listen, and consult with frontline staff, and that hasn't been done. Beyond that, I don't think that their approach towards centralization is the appropriate approach. Uh, Greens recognize that there's a lot of advantage of local community control and decentralization. We're actually asking people to drive more to get to the hospital. Mm -hmm. You know, Not only is that bad from, say, a greenhouse gas perspective, it's also just terrible from a service perspective, and we need to realize, you know, in we life... We have to create a balance. Right? Yeah, in life-threatening instances, if someone has to travel not three kilometers now to get to a hospital, they now need to travel nine or 12 kilometers. Sadly, and I, I don't say this glibly or anything, but people are going to die. That's the consequence of those types of, of policies. And then on a broader, long-term basis, we've got to think and talk more about preventative health. We have an aging population, an aging population that's getting more and more capable in their aging populations. If we focus on healthier lifestyles, if we focus on poverty reduction, as I've already talked about, we're going to actually be able to bend that health cost curve downward a little bit. And that is hugely important as well. And I don't hear the other parties really talking about that aspect as well. So would you be uh, going for a reopening of the ER set that's been closed? Yes, there's some of them that we think that need to be reopened. Um, I think that a number of them, I mean, I think there can be a way that we could streamline and triage, but it doesn't mean we should only send people to only two hospitals. And there's also a problem of a shortage of staff as well. Yeah. Um, and you know, and I'm and I'm hearing from nurses that I know that they're waiting six months or more on the waiting list to get hired by the WRJ, oh, which they? I can't understand when we're on top we're, of that. There's base freeze. The, the, yeah, when we would actually re we would we would repeal that act, the the uh, public sector sustainability act. Mm -hmm. Greens recognize that unionization actually is a fundamental right in Canadian society, and there are actually court cases that respect and recognize that. And you know, we want. You know, there is a reality that we want employees to be able to bargain and counter negotiate against their employers to help rectify the inherent power imbalance that does exist in those relations. So we would certainly repeal that with the wage freeze. And then you mentioned there's the mandatory overtime with the nurses. And even in many of our rural communities, they're unable to recruit doctors. The municipalities have taken it on themselves to start dealing with the recruitment. So these are all huge problems and we really need to start uh, addressing them and unfortunately what we've seen from this current government is no it's our way or the highway we're just going to slam it through without any care uh, or concern about what others are telling them and I think a that's they're breaking their promise from 2016 but it's also just bad policy I mean yes the government needs to implement things at times but you also need to listen to people particularly people that are on the front lines on the ground because they can often tell you well this might seem like a good idea in theory but in practice let us tell you how this is going to work and you need to listen to those voices because those are really important voices so talking about the issues in the health sector there's been another very um, big adversing factor uh, that was uh, adversely affecting the foreign students. That was mm. the cut on their medical facilities, the free medical facilities. Yeah. They used to have free medical uh, Manitoba wide, but now they have to look up to the colleges for group insurances and they have to pay something on the top of their tuition fee that's mm -hmm. already high, about three times uh, the fee uh, as compared to their resident counterparts. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, is this something the Green Party would be looking into? Yeah, I because that's the, I that's also indirect migration. People come over, students come over, they study here, then they want to live in the same province where they study, right? It's an indirect form of migration, a very effective form as well, because mm -hmm. then educated people become integrated with the with the uh, system and uh, generate income for the for the province. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree with you more in the sense that yeah th this is about equity and and making sure we're caring for people and i agree with you you know you want to sort of these international students that come in one they're already paying full freight with respect to tuition in terms of paying you know three times as much as the average student and then and accommodation to, and, as well and, and then to save a few dollars we've sort of taken this away so i certainly can tell you i don't agree with that it's something we i know the student union uh student unions have raised to our attention it's not something that actually i apologize and feel bad that didn't feature in our platform but it is something that i see from a social equity and i see exactly what you're saying that people need to realize is that you know bringing in new bright minds from other countries into our universities is a great way at recruiting new migrants and bringing new people into our society because you, 
you know, it, it's a common story. It's it's not just the healthcare. I think that's important too. But you know, someone comes to university and they meet someone and they fall in love. You know, and and then they stay here, right? That's yeah, a very common yeah. tale, and it's, it's a, a very common tale and a beautiful tale, it's a beautiful right? Tale, and, of course. And can even be a tale about you know the multiculturalism of our society in and, some and, cases. And we've seen uh, many a success stories um, related to the foreign students who mm -hmm. came here, became a part of the uh, Manitoba, our friendly Manitoba, and mm -hmm. uh, they stayed here forever, and they're doing pretty well for themselves as well. And so, how are we going to welcome these you know these new people, and instead we're welcoming them with a very and Cold, there's, closed and, and, door approach. and there's also been increase in the university fee about five percent, about five percent on an average every yeah. year. Uh, that's also uh, repelling foreign students from coming into Bento, but first the mm. medical cuts and then this one as well. Yeah, because when you add up the total package, that's a really good point. You're, so you're paying more on your tuition, plus you're paying now whatever your healthcare premiums are. And I apologize, I don't actually know what someone pays for a year to, to get insurance through the university or with Blue Cross or another mm -hmm. provider. But uh, yeah, no, without a doubt. That's no, but it is something which was not there. So yeah, basically it's from uh, whatever it is from zero up. Yeah. So uh, 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 now that we've uh, already touched education a little bit, let's go into the education sector a little bit sure. deeper. Sure. Uh, what about K-12 to review? The government wants to amalgamate all the school divisions into one or two. Will it be good for the education system or is it going to adversely affect our education system here? I think once again we got to look more towards decentralization rather than centralization similar to healthcare. I don't think it's possibly going to affect. Now to be fair, Greens do want to change how we fund our education system. We want to move uh, taxes off of property and onto income. We think that's more fair because the more money you make the more you should pay essentially is how we feel that should should work. So. That said, there still is a role for those local school boards and that's why in our policy when we discussed it we allowed for a 30% contingency for local needs because different neighborhoods might have different needs. There might be different, you know, cultural or linguistic communities that want yeah. classes in their own uh, language. There might be different special needs in a certain area. Certain rural areas may have different specific needs in terms of students traveling, etc. So we do want to allow a 30% um, budgeting portion uh, for those local school divisions to make those decisions where a 70% becomes core. Yeah. But I, I don't think that the amalgamation, once again, I think it's sort of the wrong uh, approach. Wrong uh, approach to the thing because there's been disparity uh, between school divisions. Uh, uh, like there are like rich school division, bigger school division, which have more, more, of course, students as well, and then more teachers, more resources to provide facilities to their students. But then they are like smaller. Uh, school division we don't uh, who don't have that many resources so they uh, the, this disparity uh, needs to be eliminated and they it, should have equal resources to and that's exactly why we want to get it off of part of that's because we find now there to be fair there is a, an equalization formula that helps to level that out for schools by about two-thirds but it still leaves a one-third inequity in place and that is for the same reasons I was mentioning is that because we lever uh, because school divisions raise a portion of their revenue from property taxes. Um, if you live in a neighborhood in an area of the city where the average value of the home is less, which tends to be less yeah. affluent neighborhoods, then the ability of the school division to raise money is harder because it's based on the value of the home. So of what course. they tend to do is increase the mill rate. Yep. Similarly, if you have a lot of commercial developments, a lot of malls and other suburban commercial developments, those are also taxed and they create revenue where a neighborhood may or may not have those commercial developments. And so what it sadly means is that our poorer neighborhoods very often are less able to raise the per student money than our wealthier ones can. So it means a higher mill rate on our poorer neighborhoods and it means a lower mill rate on the neighborhoods where people are more affluent. And without being too dismissive, those are the people that are most able to hire a private tutor for their student, mm -hmm. do private fundraising through the Parent Advisory Council yeah. compared to the other neighborhoods. So it, it's inequitable in our view. So that also is a big change because the last election we were looking at this in 2016, it was about 600, uh, a little bit over 600 million in revenue. Now it's 850 million in revenue because of the growth in that. But we are committed to making that shift and that shift uh, may not happen quite as fast as our basic income, but we think we can do we it over a number of years. One step at a time, right? Yeah, well, it may not happen in year one. You may have to do it over a number of years. And some of these things, to be honest, may have to be done over a number of terms. And we recognize that. So. There's also been uh, talks going about 
a privatization of MPI, mm -hmm. Manitoba Liquor and Lottery. What do you say about that? Because MPI, as they say, of course, uh, as we know, don't we don't need to mend what's not broken. So MPI, yeah. uh, we already pay, I think, uh, lease insurance premiums all over Canada. So what's the need of the privatization? What uh, do you think the government is government has uh, government is thinking behind this idea of theirs? Yeah, it's hard to know, and it's hard to know if they're actually fully committed to privatizing or if that's more coming from the other side on criticism. I agree with you. MPI certainly seems to operate very efficiently. Uh, it's hard to see a for-cost insurer, you know, for-profit insurer coming in over a crown-owned corporation that operates basically at yeah. cost. Um, also, from a climate change perspective, there's a lot of advantages, I think, of ways that we could roll in by keeping a single insurer. Of course. So I don't think you know, I don't think there's a real argument um, for the privatization of MPI. Um, the real question is, as I understand it, it's not that the, PC, the PCs have said that they are going to do it, there's speculation that they will do it if they get another term. So it's very difficult to know how they're going to deal with that and certainly now we have the government, I would argue, inappropriately interfering with the negotiations with the broker. I mean, if we're going to allow our Crown Corps to exist, we should give them a little bit of room and allow them to, you know, enter those negotiations and and so and you're make in those favor of keeping the MPI intact, not going to the privatization. Yeah, right? no, we we. Would. What about the Manitoba Liquor and Lottery? Uh, with liquor and lotteries, we wouldn't privatize it. That said, um, we do need to recognize uh, perhaps a little bit more of a separation between the importing role and the direct retail role. Some of our private wine stores that are trying to fill a niche market have yeah. often felt what they feel is somewhat unfair competition from yeah. other liquor lotteries, which we think could easily be uh, solved by simply separating the import. Uh, sector from the distribution sector and creating uh, more of a division between the two. But so that's how we would deal with that. But then again, you know, when we were talking about the education sector, uh, you were in a support of decentralization. But then again, when we came to MPI and Manitoba Liquor and Lottery, you were in support of centralization. So are there uh, two different things uh, that we're talking uh, about here? Point. I don't know. No, I think, I think you know, once again, I think you have to look at things on a contextual basis, so it's hard to, you know, it's hard to apply a general rule to absolutely everything, but I don't know that MPI, um, yes, it's a single insurer, um, but if you had multiple private companies, I don't know that services would be better. I mean, certainly, as it stands right now, and there's some discussions about moving away from the brokers or going online only, but certainly, uh, most local communities, every small community, and all over Winnipeg, there you know there is an accessible auto pack dealership. So to say that it's somehow centralized in the same way, centralized in the sense that all people should come through the same doorway, I don't think that's the case with MPI. Um, so I, I think there's a slight difference with it. And to be fair, uh, you know, general rules are only that, and that you always need to be context I specific. And what matters is the end result, right? Where we're we going. Uh, we need better facilities for yeah. people uh, at cheaper rates. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and yeah, and I think MPI has been delivering that. I mean, there's always any kind of public insurer. There's there's always trade-offs, right? Anything else has some trade-offs. So we are approaching uh, the end of today's segment. Before uh, leaving, uh, let me touch a little bit on the uh, drug addiction. Mm -hmm apart and also the escalation in the violence in the violent crime rate in Manitoba yeah. what are you going to do about it because you, on your agenda you're specifically you mentioned you'll be you are into environment you're into poverty eradication you're into health mm -hmm. health as well so where does uh, this uh, meth addiction or drug addiction and uh, crime in Manitoba uh, lie on your list Sure. No, uh, there's there's a number of aspects to highlight on that. I mean, the first thing is to recognize that addiction is primarily a health concern. I think sometimes we want to think of it all as... And it also leads to crime in a way. It, no, it doesn't. I don't come to that. But I think we always want to look at it just as a public safety or just crime. But I think we have to ultimately recognize it's a health issue. And there's also corresponding linkages often with mental health and other issues. So I think we have to recognize that health side. There's no doubt that we've seen a meth crisis in this city and we've seen it, you know, across North America. Um, we got to start on once again a prevention first. So we got to recognize that the health, we need to figure out how we're going to help people when they finally need treatment. You know, a couple of the challenges right now that exist that I've uncovered on treatment is 
One, even if you can't get someone referred, they often need a doctor's note, which is ten or thirty dollars to get. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, for an addict, they're really considering how yeah. to spend that ten or thirty dollars, and it might be on the next hit. Yeah. Not on getting help. We yeah. need more addictions treatments facilities to get people in to help. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, we are going to need, you know, better policing strategies where we're also trying to deal with it on a policing side. But I don't think we can deal with this policing alone. I think if we don't understand the linkages between poverty, between mental health and the health uh, things, if we don't deal with this, you know, if we only deal with the supply side of the equation and we don't deal with the demand side of it, I think we're not really properly looking at the problem. And it's certainly an issue that I'm hearing all the time when I'm knocking at the doors. And I know Winnipeggers are rightfully concerned about yeah about the kids as well right the future yeah, generation and, and stuff. safety and needles being left around in, yeah. in my neck of the woods yeah. where i live by pemna and jubilee and we're you know but we're trying to do that we're trying to create community watch groups people that are walking around to pick up those needles you know yes we need police but we also need stronger communities people that know their neighbors that are communicating with their neighbors and it's also biohazard per se right? yeah so, but this is what i'm saying where yeah. stronger communities and a little bit more support from government for these i mean probably the best example was was the mobile clinic that mm -hmm. doctors without borders were trying to get and because they were so busy slamming through this health transition yeah. they said no to free money and, yeah. and ditto with money for our schools just to go back to education so i think that's you know something we got to look at well it's time to wrap up our today's episode thank you so much james my pleasure. for coming in my pleasure and all the very best to green party thank and you you as well from fort rouge and we can all we can all we can say is be the best person win i hope so and it should be an interesting race thank you it's an aj sade naal james badam jede ke ne green party of manitoba the leader nadi naal mla candidate from fort rouge constituency uh assi is silsile nu agge vadhaunde ravange election special de taur de utte kyunki elections hun bahut neede pahunch chukiyan ne hor vi candidates naal assi tuadi mulakat karavange sade ise hi program de vich so jude raho vision punjab tv de naal